So we all know Konami, right? Okay, we aren't exactly a hot commodity or anything, but you go back to those 8-bit and 16-bit eras, and you couldn't get a better third-party company making a game for your console. Contra, Castlevania, Goemon, all perfection. Konami also worked on a number of licensed properties, classic arcade beat-em-ups like The Simpsons and Ninja Turtles. Known names sell, of course, and past successes sell as well, so Konami relied heavily on licensed games and sequels. There were a few Konami employees, including Masato Maegawa and Hideyuki Suganami, talented programmers for the company, that grew frustrated at the idea of working again and again on games that, well, weren't original ideas. They began to feel a loss of creativity or originality, which makes sense. Konami, like any gaming company, saw profit in sticking with well-known properties. Why gamble on an original idea when you know Ninja Turtles and Contra are going to sell well. Anyways, Suganami and Maegawa, well, they present their own ideas to the higher-ups at Konami, but as it goes, would get denied. So at some point in 1992, they broke away from Konami to start their own independent company, Treasure. Other members of Konami would leave for Treasure as well, with Maegawa not only producing every Treasure game, but being the president of the company. A very ambitious and perhaps wild move, quitting a comfy job in favor of expressing creativity, it's certainly inspiring. They released their first original game, Gunstar Heroes, on the Sega Genesis in 93. Today you can play games many different ways, whether it's through the original cartridge or disc, or the many, many re-releases on official emulation. Gunstar Heroes, for example, was officially ported to PlayStation 2, Wii Virtual Console, Xbox Live, PlayStation Network, Apple iOS. A scaled-down version was also ported to the handheld Sega Game Gear, and an advanced 3D version was ported to the 3DS. Mitsuru Yaida, just like Maegawa and Suganami, worked at Konami but joined them at Treasure to work as the main programmer for the game. Suganami helped with the programming as well, with Maegawa supervising the project. You really can't talk about Treasure without also mentioning the others who helped to make their games look and feel distinct. Artist Tetsuhiko Kikuchi has just that, a rather distinct style that certainly stood out at the time, and composer Norio Hanzawa created a great soundtrack. Norio, I feel, is a very underrated composer. When you hear a soundtrack he made, you just know it's his. But also the sound design in a game is also an underrated component. Sure, it won't make or break a game, but Satoshi Murata not only made the sounds for this game, which has a lot going on, but also Sin and Punishment and Mischief Makers. The sound design for those are amazing, but I'm getting ahead of myself. But not only did these creators all join Treasure, but they would all get their chance to actually be a director for games during their time at Treasure, which is pretty cool. But yeah, Gunstar Heroes was the first step for Treasure to show the gaming world what can be possible when passionate developers, programmers, composers, and artists can create on their own terms without being held back. Well, they did what they could with the hardware provided. The game was a bit too ambitious as it pushed the boundaries on what a Genesis should be able to do. You see, the small team at Treasure were all used to working on titles for Konami on Super Nintendo, a stronger hardware that allowed for more intricate graphics and sprites. But the Genesis had a better processor, so the team focused on doing everything they could to make Gunstar Heroes a breakthrough success. They took their skills working on games like Contra 3, a genre they were familiar with, the run and gun side scroller, took some similar elements and ran wild with it multiple enemies on the screen that wouldn't slow down gameplay, 16 different weapon combinations, a very high number for the time, stages were short and enemies can be easily mowed down, but the boss battles can make the game stand out. Using the gimmick of the weapon combinations to battle these gigantic enemies, co-op also available. The story, much like most treasure games, is a bizarrely hilarious concept that is different depending on which region version you play. Stories and treasure games are usually less important 
almost throwaway compared to the gameplay, visuals, and creative gimmicks they came up with to breathe new life into these familiar genres. The result of their first project was a video game that became the must-own side-scrolling action title on Genesis. Reviews back then praised the game for being refreshing. How many beat-em-ups existed back then? A lot, but Gunstar Heroes just made it all more exciting. As a side note, back in those days, America got shafted with some ugly cover art. Like what happened here? Treasure worked with Sega at first, promising a great action game in the form of Gunstar Heroes, but any new team that had something to prove had to provide incentive, so Sega wanted a popular licensed game to be made as well. So as much as Treasure wanted to focus on new ideas, the reality is that while working on Gunstar Heroes, Treasure also worked on a McDonald's game. Well, McDonald's was immensely popular with children, so I guess it makes sense when you think about it. It was released around the same time as Gunstar Heroes, and was actually well received. There was one stipulation, and that was for the McDonald's characters to retain their classic design. So the team at Treasure took the opportunity to familiarize themselves with the hardware and see what kind of slower paced side-scrolling game they could make. Maegawa supervised this game as well, but also worked as a programmer. Koichi Kimura, who had worked mostly as a graphics designer at Konami, filled the role of director, and composer Katsuhiko Suzuki, a former Konami member as well, worked on the soundtrack, though would later return to Konami in 98. By the way, this one can cost as much as $50, whereas if Gunstar Heroes can be as low as $60, which isn't bad. I'll talk about the modern prices for all of these treasure games. So it was a good start for Treasure with their partner at Sega, a best-selling action game and a well-received McDonald's one as well. But they quickly began working on their next title, Dynamite Heady. Another bizarre concept, but the unique gimmick implemented made for a different experience. I think what Treasure excels at is taking familiar gaming formulas but adding a twist to them. The puppet-like character used parts of its body to attack. Innovation is what kept Treasure separate from others. It was released in 94 with, yet again, positive reviews. Koichi Kimura took the role as director and graphics director, with the hopes of creating his own personal vision for what a video game should look like. Maegawa again helped as a programmer, so Treasure began to grow in members and Sega wanted more from the company. So as a team were working on this game, three other small teams at Treasure were all working on their own games, with some members jumping from project to project. This was a four game deal with Sega. Like Kimura, Kikuchi, who had previously worked mostly as a graphics designer, took the position of director for the second project, a 2D fighting game based on one of the greatest anime series of all time, Yu Yu Hakusho. Yaida had moved on from being the programmer of Gunstar Heroes to this game. Sound duties were split between Norio and Murata, so Treasure proved to Sega they could do run and gun and side scrolling, but they then decided to tackle the fighting genre dominated by the likes of the Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat. Though there were some initial fears of the game not being able to handle 4 player combat, Treasure wanted that to be their main reason for fans of those games to try out something new. And the game was released to, surprise, much love and praise. The gimmick of jumping between foreground and background to battle was a fun touch. And though Treasure had earlier concepts of an original fighting game, they took those ideas to work on a licensed game because 1. it would sell, and 2. they felt it would be too similar to a game that had been released as they began working on their original IP. Which game? Well, one of the Fatal Furies had that similar line system, so perhaps that? The third team worked on Alien Soldier, another run and gun game similar to Gunstar Heroes. Much like that one, the emphasis wasn't on long stages but gimmicky gameplay and intense boss battles. Simple formula, but one that Treasure excelled at. Key Treasure members, Suganami, took the director's chair comfortable with the run and gun gameplay. Now, I've read some interesting notes that members of Treasure felt it was released incomplete, despite getting great reviews. 
with Suganami himself stating he wished to have worked on it longer before it was released. But with deadlines and the Genesis coming to the end of its cycle, Alien Soldier had to be released sooner than expected in 95. The last of the four-part project was Light Crusader, an isometric action-adventure with light RPG elements, a stark contrast to what came before it. The trio of Kazuhiko Ishida, KJ Fujitake, and Maegawa worked on the programming of the game. Other treasure members bounced from the other projects to work on the visuals and sounds. The key element to this title was to work with the pseudo 3D available at the time, with the puzzles and action being almost a secondary component. Treasure always strived to make something different, and well, they did with Light Crusader, though the end result wasn't all positive reviews. It was the first time a treasure game had mixed reception. Development seemed a bit troubling on the Genesis hardware with production starting over at some point. It was released in 95 right at the end of the console's life cycle. And with that, the four project deal with Sega came to an end and Treasure would set their sights on further expansion. Roundup time. Dynamite Heady, complete, can cost as low as $50 for this Genesis version, with the Game Gear version costing up to $160. Yu Yu Hakusho can go up to $150. Alien Soldier, never being released in physical format in the US and late to the console's lifespan, is going to cost a whopping $600 or more. Yikes. Like Crusader, $50 complete. Kikuchi, the artist with that distinct style, was up to create his vision of a video game, partnering with Masaki Ukyo, and thus Guardian Heroes on the Sega Saturn began development. With new, powerful hardware to get their hands on, the possibilities grew. The stronger hardware allowed the team at Treasure to play around with just how many characters can be on the screen at once. The initial fears weren't a slowdown or lag, but confusing the gamers with how much was going on. But that's what the team wanted. Four player beat em up chaos. Guardian Heroes was a treasure take on games like Final Fight or Golden Axe, made to be played with multiple people. Four characters with different play styles, many branching paths, and excellent combat made Guardian Heroes one of the must own Saturn games. And for those fortunate enough to own one today, well, the game alone will cost you nearly $300. Alongside composers and sound designers Norio and Suzuki, a member of the highly influential synth rock group Yellow Magic Orchestra lent his talent to the soundtrack. So if you can't get your hands on the game, give the soundtrack a listen because it's excellent. It was remastered for the Xbox Live Arcade. Can people even access that still? Back in 96, Kikuchi had a rather progressive mindset with the belief that gamers just wanted the game to do most of the work for them, like experiencing a movie. Now today, that's certainly more common than in 1996, but it was that mentality that led Treasure to put the entire focus on having the gamer play a game, which is why Treasure releases were never story heavy. Now the Sega Saturn was hit or miss with the gaming audience, the focus then shifted to the PlayStation and Nintendo's odd little console, the Nintendo 64. Revolutionary at the time for many gaming companies, they were able to develop 3D worlds with those 64 bits. Treasure's jump into a Nintendo platform saw another 2D release, Mischief Makers. Mischief Makers is arguably my favorite treasure game. I just have fond memories and it holds up relatively well decades later. Because it's a 2.5D game on a console where most 3D games just suffer from some ugly visuals looking back at them now. And you only move using the D-pad. Yeah, not a whole lot of games really use this. You know, I have a bunch of controllers all with nearly broken joysticks, but the D-pads live on. Marina Lightyears, the ultra cool, ultra intergalactic robot maid. I always wanted her in Super Smash Bros. There's just a whole lot of interesting character designs here, these weird characters like the gyroids in Animal Crossing. And despite not having an expansive world like in, say, Ocarina of Time, Mischief Makers was just packed with a lot of style. Especially considering the team working for this game, all in all, was less than 20 people. 
distinct treasure style, beautifully colored backgrounds, great characters, platforming, puzzles, shaking, boss battles that are fun, dodgeball with cats. It isn't a long game, but the real challenge is getting the gold gem on each stage to unlock the true ending, especially on that yard dash stage. It has an absolutely stellar soundtrack by Norio Hanzawa. And I mentioned it earlier, but the sound effects by Murata are iconic. Complete, this one sits at about $200. Director Hideyuki Suganami would stay busy right after that 1997 release with his follow-up, Sin and Punishment, released four years later. In the meantime though, another team was working on a Saturn game, Silhouette Mirage. It would also be ported to PlayStation a year later. I always like to try out these games, and it's always possible one way or another today. Interesting concept, of course. Execution, a bit mediocre. It reminds me of Mischief Makers, that 2D vibrant world. There's a lot of duality going on here. Dual damage mechanic, two opposing factions destroying the world. The main character here being able to change to two different forms in order to beat enemies. Looking at websites like Metacritic, the reviews for this one are all over the place. Game Informer gave it a 75. GameSpot a 46, and IGN of all people with a high 89. Check out this one review from Karen F, sounds about right. The game is so cutesy that it makes me sick. Boring enemies and bad plot. I feel sorry for all those who actually bought this. 3 out of 10. Now I wonder what exactly gave it those 3 points though. All the elements are here, creative art design, great soundtrack, bizarre characters, unique abilities, but for some reason, this is one that never really caught on. Then again, most treasure games didn't really catch on. Obviously, it was polarizing at the time of release. And as much as I loved games like Mischief Makers and Bangayo as a kid, this was one I never even heard of until doing research for this video. Ukyo had a hit previously with Guardian Heroes, but fell a bit short with Silhouette Mirage, but that's okay. The Saturn version can cost about $50, and the PlayStation version? I don't even know what to say about this. I love how weird the art is, though. So in 1998, Treasure had plenty of experience by that point with stronger hardware. They played around with a few different types of gameplay, had a solid number of teams emphasizing on fun experiences. But it wasn't until 98 that their first shoot 'em up was released a genre of games that they're best known for, and they were certainly the masters at creating them in hindsight. Side-scrolling or vertical, the shooter was a category that had been in gaming since pretty much the very beginning. It's interesting to think that Treasure weren't comfortable at first taking the leap into the vertical shooter, but they stuck to a vision and didn't want to compromise, thus Radiant Silver Gun was developed. A small group of pilots known as Silver Guns return to a destroyed Earth to take out the monsters and crystals that originally destroyed it. I guess you don't need a deep story for a game like this, but the anime cutscenes are a nice touch. Hiroshi Uchi, who had worked mostly as a graphics designer previously, directed and planned Radiant Silver Gun, after reflecting on the then Japanese arcades. At the time, fighting games were all the rage but members at Treasure would often reminisce about when shooting games were the ones that filled the arcades. So perhaps a bit of nostalgia lit a fire in the team and they wanted to bring some light into the fading category. It's also funny to read about Iuchi and Maegawa speaking about how game developers were relying too much on remakes, and that was back in 98. Unlike other shooters the team had played that all mostly relied on the shooting and bombing mechanics, they again want to see how to create a creative new spin. From the start of the game, you are given the option to choose from many different weapons without relying on picking up items throughout the stage. A mechanic treasure found would be too confusing for casual players, and focused on creating terrains that would help aid the player's eyes to see the influx of bullets coming at you. 
but also slowing down bullets to again to help a casual player play a type of game that definitely would scare off normies. Now I love shooting games but I am bad at them. I am definitely very casual with these types of games. People always love to say how tough Dark Souls and the like are now, but play a shoot 'em up. Try beating one of those games and then tell me which are harder. So not only was this Treasure's first take on the shooting genre, but also their first arcade release, and what they had hoped to accomplish as an indie company came true. It was popular in Japanese arcades, and Sega Saturn port was loved, with praise given to the interesting scoring mechanic where rather than getting points for shooting everything, shooting a combination of certain color enemies in a row will net you more points instead. And despite Treasure feeling as though they created an entry-friendly game, yeah, Radiant Silver Gun is hard as hell. There were some pretty cool models floating around for these as well. Sometimes I complain about Dreamcast game prices, but Saturn is just on a whole other level. Complete, you're gonna spend at least $250. It has been ported digitally to other consoles though, very recently on the Nintendo Switch. As members worked on Radiant Silver Gun, others worked alongside Enix on a PlayStation Rakugaki Showtime, an exclusive to Japan. It's kind of like a party fighting game, you know, like Power Stone perhaps. The visuals are creative with paper-like characters Basically, you pick up stuff and throw it at each other. A side note, a Tiny Toons game with the same mechanics was also developed by Treasure, but it was cancelled. A copy of this game costs over $200. Moving on, 1999 also saw the release of Bangai O. It was originally released only in Japan on the Nintendo 64, but a much better version was released on the Dreamcast a few years later. Yaida and a small number of members worked on it, trying to make a game that would push what they've played around with before to the limit. The Nintendo 64's hardware was decent, but even more was done with the Dreamcast version. The 2D sprites and art are great, and being able to switch between two characters with their mechs serving different purposes, Ricky has homing missiles whereas Mommy has lasers that bounce off walls, implementing both to get through stages is a fun challenge. Boss fights are, well, sometimes you just have to sit there and shoot the guy, other times you can get completely destroyed. The gimmick here is that you can build up a gauge and counter at the right moment. You can completely beat a boss with one perfectly timed counter. The music by Norio and company is funky and catchy. And the story, well, the translation, is hilariously bad. It was very limitedly released on the Nintendo 64, making it one of the most expensive Japanese exclusives, and the Dreamcast version sits at the typical Dreamcast price range of 100 to 150. Artist Yasushi Suzuki worked on the grittier looking games for Treasure, having been the key artist for Ikaruga, emphasis on ships and more post-apocalyptic settings and enemies, and in 2000 illustrated the main art for the Nintendo 64 game, Sin and Punishment. A bleak and stark contrast to the goofier stories of previous games and art of Kikuji. Unlike Mischief Makers, which is likely still owned by Enix, now stuck in Square Enix Purgatory, Sin and Punishment was developed by Treasure, mainly with Suganami in charge, yes, but alongside Nintendo themselves. That explains why there are references to this game found in Super Smash Bros. and Saki being a trophy in one of them, but also why it's possible to play this on consoles other than the Nintendo 64, including the Nintendo Switch Online release. But it's a great pair, Treasure with their extensive knowledge in shooters and Nintendo taking cues from their established rail shooter, Star Fox. Combining both forces together made a very interesting, though perhaps niche, game in Sin and Punishment. Development was rocky, as this was Treasure's first take on a kind of 3D experience. You would think a game on this level wouldn't take 4 years to create, but it did. The story, being straight out of some dystopian cyberpunk anime, fighting invading monsters, but also authoritative forces, so yes, everyone is your enemy in this game. It has co-op, which is a nice bonus. 
You can shoot enemies, but also explosive objects to create more damage, slash at closer enemies, and also deflect certain projectiles right back at them. It's fun, arcadey, and chaotic. Definitely a highlight on that Nintendo Switch lineup. The Japanese audience loved it, critics and gamers alike. The flashy action stood out amongst other Nintendo 64 games, and the graphics at the time were impressive. Looking back at it today, they're kind of creepy. Being a Japanese exclusive, but also a Nintendo published game, the pricing isn't so bad compared to Bangayo. 2000 also had a PlayStation 2 exclusive shooter, Silk Heed The Lost Planet. Game Arts and Treasure developed the sequel, keeping the original integrity of Game Arts director Takeshi Miyagi, though his role for Lost Planet was purely producer, so two teams that are great at the category, and well, even with their expertise in the field, the game had a very mixed reception. Very divisive game, but who do you listen to? Much like mech games, you know, like Armored Core, shoot 'em ups will certainly get beat up by most gaming journalists, and you really shouldn't go by mainstream reviews for games in these categories. Instead, look for shoot 'em up websites or even subreddits. That being said, the general consensus in the fandom seems to be that it's an okay game. Probably one to skip if you want to get into shoot 'em ups. Speaking of shoot 'em ups, perhaps Treasure's magnum opus, beloved by critics and shoot 'em up fanatics, Ikaruga released the following year in 2001 for the Naomi Arcade. It was co developed by G Rev, a company with their own resume of shoot 'em ups. Together, they created one of the most popular examples in the vertical shooter. In 2002, it was ported to Dreamcast, and again, Japan only for some reason. And that's why the Dreamcast was so special. They were as close to arcade perfection any console was capable of doing up to that point. Yuji's team did everything they could to make it a more casual, friendly experience. This time being kind of true, limiting the enemy colors and projectiles to two colors so that you don't get lost in the maze of bullets. It has great visuals, an interesting mechanic of switching between two different colors that correspond to enemy fire, so constant switching is required, but fun. The Radiant Silver Gun team toyed with the idea of breaking away from the traditional vertical shooter, but with Ikaruga they wanted to stray further away from the typical conventions. They knew the shooter was a dying category, so they focused on Ikaruga appealing to their core fanbase. And secondly, they wanted to have fun with this game by focusing on different ways to experience a vertical shooter. Bullet Hell is a term you'll hear describe the more chaotic shooters. Ikaruga certainly fits that statement, but it isn't so bad. With the Dreamcast nearing an end, Treasure planned on porting it later to the GameCube as well in 2003, which they did. And then, well, after that, it was ported to a lot of different consoles. 2001 also had the release of some PlayStation 2 game I've never heard of, Stretch Panic. Moving on. By 2002, Treasure began to produce more and more mediocre titles, unfortunately. Few would be standouts or original, with most of them being some sort of anime adaptation. So from this point on, rather than talk about each title, I'll go year by year and focus on the standouts. In 2002, they began creating handheld games on the Game Boy Advance. First to release was Tiny Toon Adventures Buster's Bad Dream. I actually remember when this came out, but what I've never guessed it was Treasure. In 2003, Treasure released four games, unusual for them as they would usually release one or two a year. Hajime no Ippo, the boxing anime, had a Game Boy Advance adaptation. Dragon Drive, some anime I've never heard of, had a game released on the GameCube, both with painfully mediocre reviews. They also once again teamed up with Nintendo to work on a Wario game for the GameCube, Wario World, a 3D adventure breaking away from what Wario was used to in those Wario Land games, you know, 2D platformers, which is weird because it's a genre that Treasure certainly excelled at. Nintendo wanted something different for their evil plumber, releasing the minigame collection WarioWare alongside this one. The standout from these four releases though, a game based on the vintage anime series Astro Boy. 
Astro Boy Omega Factor a very surprising hit. At first it seemed like an out of nowhere choice, but at the time there was an anime reboot in the works. This robotic character could kind of work like Mega Man, and it does sort of play like that, though it's much more of a hybrid. Sometimes it's a beat em up, other times a shooter, and a where am I going type of game. It's addictive as nothing lingers too long and the gameplay is mixed up frequently with constant fun boss battles. It can be difficult, but it's a good challenge that doesn't get too frustrating. Wario World Complete is pretty typical as far as GameCube pricing is concerned. Dragon Drive, the Japanese exclusive, is much cheaper. Hajime no Ippo, yeah that's about right. And Astro Boy, yep. In 2004, Treasure and G-Rep teamed up once again to work on another shoot'em up. Their last PlayStation 2 shooting effort didn't get the most positive feedback, but they redeemed themselves with Gradius V. But wait, Gradius, a beloved series published by Konami. So Treasure, the small team that broke away from Konami in the early 90s, was now hired by them to work on a series. Ironic in many ways. But there was something off about this release. Sure, the game received great reviews, but this was Gradius, a well-established series. And this one didn't offer a radically different experience with any quirky gimmicks. This was Treasure just sticking to the formula. And that kind of went against what they had always believed. PlayStation 2 pricing is very bizarre. Sometimes you get absurd amounts with those who cares horror games, and sometimes you find games for under $10. But a game like this, it goes for at least $60 used. So as Iuchi worked alongside G-Rev and Konami for Gradius, Kikuji, Kitagawa, and Ukyo with Norio Composin worked on a sequel to their Saturn release for the Game Boy Advance, Advance Guardian Heroes. Always ambitious, the game on the small hardware suffered from frame rate issues. The sole purpose of the original game was to get as many enemies to battle on the screen as possible, but in handheld form, you could only do so much with it. Linking up with other Game Boy Advance players is cool for multiplayer, but with the laggy experience the game didn't do too well with the critics, this one goes for about $80 complete. Following year 2005 saw the release of a sequel to another beloved treasure classic, Gunstar Heroes, with Gunstar Super Heroes. Unlike Advanced Guardian Heroes, Gunstar got huge praise. Something about that classic treasure formula just never aged poorly. It's great fun, and anyone looking to get into the beat em up but perhaps want to more than what's offered in the slower paced series? You can't go wrong with Gunstar, and a classic treasure team worked on this one. Perhaps one of the last titles that would feature a team like this. Prices are all over the place. I mean, it has the usual ugly Game Boy Advance pricing, meaning you're going to spend at least $80 complete, and can go up to $150. 2006. Bleach, Blade of Fates on the Nintendo DS. A fighting versus anime game like their Genesis Yu Yu Hakusho release, and the follow-up in 2007, Bleach Dark Souls. They are beloved games, and I remember hearing about how good these games were back in the day. Truth be told, I would have never guessed these were treasure-developed games, though it is their formula with the fighting system. Even at the point of these DS releases, Treasure disregarded the implemented touchscreen. They probably could have made good use with it, but nah, they like their D-pad and button combination. Blade of Fate goes for about 40 complete, and Dark Souls, yeah, Dark Souls, is around the same price. 2008 had the release of Bangayo Spirits on the DS. I was very excited for it. I bought it when it was released, but I kind of was disappointed. It lacked charm, which made the original so memorable, and I decided to give it another chance. And I actually enjoy it now. It's still that Bangayo formula I really loved on the Dreamcast. Complete in the box gets up to $40, not bad for a DS game. Another Bleach game, this time exclusive to Japan for some reason, Versus Crusade, released on the Wii. This was the time period of those arcade style fighting anime games like Naruto and Dragon Ball Z. It was presented as a much more casual experience than what you'd expect from Treasure, but the reviews weren't as good as the DS games. I mean, get it complete for 35 bucks. 
2009 had another Wii release, a sequel to their Nintendo-collaborated 64 game, Sin and Punishment. Now we are in the future of the original game's story, and things are still pretty hectic. Now playing as the son of the characters from the first one, on a new planet Earth, well, the fifth in the game's timeline. Great arcade action on rails, but free to move around the screen, shoot, slash, and play in co-op. In an interview in 2009 with the then president of Nintendo, Iwata, during one of his Iwata Ask segments, where he talks to numerous game developers and producers about certain projects, it was discussed that Treasure was rather difficult to work with because of how much the team wanted to push the hardware to get their visions realized. It's admirable, of course, but funny to hear the likes of Iwata more or less say that the Nintendo 64 was a weak console that was frustrating to work with. Now with the sequel, Nintendo once again found it difficult to work with Treasure. Though the Wii was certainly more than strong enough to handle an on-rails shooter, it's the nature of the Treasure games with getting as much stuff on the screen at once that was difficult to program. Eventually though, they were able to make a game that was a success. Sure, maybe not commercially, but critically. It is one of the best Wii games in my opinion, and has luckily stayed at a relatively cheap price range, 30 to $40. I had this really cool display piece from GameStop that got destroyed and I can't find another one like it. Things got a bit quiet after that release. 2011 saw an Xbox Live exclusive Bangayo HD Missile Fury. Much like the DS game, it lacked that fun spirit. It did have a level editor and multiplayer though. One issue, it's forever locked on the 360's Live Arcade, which was delisted a while ago. The irony, all of these expensive second-hand treasure games, and the one you just cannot play at all now, is a digital-only one, and people want to say digital is the way of the future. In 2013 and 14, Capcom hired Treasure to develop two Japan-only 3DS games, Geist Crusher, based on some children's manga series. They look like decent games, and different from what we've seen earlier from Treasure, and apparently there are rumors that the cancelled Mega Man Legends 3 on the 3DS had some assets and ideas that eventually went into these. Both of them can be bought for about $20. So that's a quick look at their entire library. I really like how key members were all sort of given the chance to create their own vision of a video game whether it be someone who was usually just a designer or programmer. The emphasis on unity and just creating fun games. But where did it all go wrong? I'm not sure. Could be the changing environment over the years, lack of sales for their odd games. There are two known cancelled games, like the one I mentioned earlier, the tiny tunes in the vein of Rakugaki Showtime which was actually uploaded online so it's possible to check it out, which is awesome. And another cancelled game, Gunbeat, was planned for the Sega Naomi arcade board in 99 or 2000, which also means it probably would have been ported to the Dreamcast since most Naomi games were. It's funny that there's more written info on this game than most actual released treasure games online. It would have been a treasure take on a racing game. Inspiration was taken from wacky races, and would have included four-way races with an emphasis on battling each other, like Mario Kart. The one piece of footage of the game is hard to get a good look at, but that music... If you listen, it's definitely Norio. What a shame. In an old Dreamcast magazine, it was stated that the game was indefinitely delayed because conditions were not satisfactory for Treasure. Well, I think we can safely say it's no longer delayed and just dead. Treasure has been reduced to just a handful of members, but they still exist. It's hard to find much, if any, updated information on members of the company. Maigawa is still president, however, there have been no new games in the works. There have been re-releases of games like Ikaruga and Radiant Silvergun with minor updates. You'd think someone like Nintendo would hire them, have them make a new Star Fox. Hideyuki Suganami hasn't worked on anything I can find since Star's successor in 2009. Hiroshi Uchi is associated with M2 these days, a company that specializes in retro game re-releases. 
Tetsuhiko Kikuchi still works as an artist, as recently as last year's Cotton Fantasy. Mitsuru Yaida, not much is known since his involvement with Bengayo and Xbox Live. Norio Hanzawa is credited in a few projects, depending on which website you visit. Yasushi Suzuki seems to be the busiest these days, working on art for games in the Xenoblade Chronicles series and Oninaki. The idea of them realistically ever working on a new game doesn't seem very likely. Gamers today, the younger generation, they don't seem to care for this old style of gameplay. It would just be silly to think Treasure would ever make a comeback in today's environment. Oh, and that 2022 tease from them? Well, Radiant Silver Gun was released on newer consoles, so the hopes of a new Sin and Punishment or Gunstar Heroes? Yeah, forget about it.